Diolch am y mynd o ni yng Nghanadledd Cenedlaethol Seren, dwi'n fel ag unrhyw gwyth, ewch yn bellach. Thank you for joining us in the Seren National Conference 2018, Above and Beyond, dyma sesiwn. This is session Tech Gwib, Cyfrifiadurig, IT, Computer Sciences. I'm going to talk to you about my research. So I'm a PhD, I'm not a PhD student anymore, I'm actually a fully fledged doctor, which is why it says doctor. Um, so I did my PhD at Cardiff University and I'm one of the lecturers there. How many of you like disaster films? Come on, Independence Day, a little bit of Will Smith, um, 2012, Day After Tomorrow, we all love it. Well, I, I, I'm absolutely obsessed with disaster films. I like the format. But the main reason I'm obsessed with them is I remember watching, I think it was Armageddon, and I remember watching it, and the guy walked in, and they've got all these laptops and these computers and all these fancy simulations, and they're telling all these people, these top people in government, that the world is about to end. And I remember looking at the screen and thinking, I want that job. And then as you watch the disaster film, one after the other, you realise the most important person in the room is the one that's walking in with a laptop telling everyone the world's going to end in eight days. So I had an ambition. I was going to build simulation models. I was going to take lots and lots of data from around the world and I was going to build simulation models and one day I was going to save the planet. It doesn't quite work like that. But this is my attempt at modelling the world. And when I say model in the world, one tiny little bit at a time, okay? So when we think about it, we are absolutely surrounded by data. And it comes in all different forms. And we have to somehow make sense of that data. We have to do stuff with it. Now, when I do systems modeling, I am, in essence, um, working with data, constantly working with data. I would class myself as a data scientist. Okay? And I use data analytics. I look at how, what, when, where, why. I try to make sense of all this data that we're surrounded with. Okay? And I use systems thinking to do it. I use systems thinking because it's non-linear. It's holistic. I'm constantly thinking of the whole. I can look at a small part, but never lose sight of the whole. I look at chains of cause and effect. I try to look at it so I can predict behaviour. It is systematic, it's a nice orderly way of thinking, but at the same time it is systemic. Data analytics. There's six types that are commonly used. We've got descriptive, so what has happened, what is happening now. We've got diagnostic, why did it happen? Prescriptive, pretty much like diagnostic, but you go in a little bit deeper. If you think in terms of medicine, you might have a diagnosis and then you have to find out why. So why has that particular diagnosis occurred? Exploratory, so we look at patterns, we try and find patterns and trends in the data. And then we have predictive, so we look at the exploratory, what are the patterns, what are the trends, how can we then apply that so we can see what's going to happen in the future? And then causal, so we look at how is this all happening? Now the system dynamics approach, we use something called, well systems thinking, we use something called system dynamics. System dynamics involves cybernetics and control theory. Cybernetics is a really cool word, isn't it? We love the word cyber, it implies robotic. I mean, I'm a massive Doctor Who fan, so when I think cybernetics, I always think cybermen. Um, and control theory. Now, cybernetics and control theory is the mother of AI. How many of you are into artificial intelligence? Don't be afraid to shout out. We love it. Come on. We're surrounded by it at the moment. It is the future. Well, cybernetics and control theory are the reason that we've got AI and machine learning. Okay? So when you think of control theory, think in terms of when we have a shower in the morning. Okay? We know what we like. We know what temperature we want. So we have our desired state. Okay? And then we have the water that's coming out. So we've got a tap that controls the water and the temperature. So as the tap, as we're moving the tap, we're measuring what the temperature is of the water and we know what our desired state is. So we keep twi twisting the knob until we get to our desired state. That is control theory. And that's pretty much what AI does. It has a state, it understands what it wants to achieve, 
it understands where it currently is and it has the mechanisms to get you from A to B. All right. So in system dynamics, we use stocks and flows to identify um, reality. So we think of the world in terms of stocks and flows. And then we identify unintended consequences. This is something called fixes that fail. So we try to map the structure of the system to see if it's going to be out of control. The central concepts are information action consequence, exactly the same as control theory. And we have two types of loops, positive and negative. So how many of you think positive might be a good thing? Come on, don't be shy. How many think positive good? Negative bad? When you look at control theory, it's completely the other way around. Positive is a really bad thing. Okay, now when we refer to positive and negative in terms of loop structure, we would look at a graph that was a maybe exponential growth. So the graph kind of goes like that. Okay, now the problem with positive feedback when you've got exponential growth it takes a very small change to turn exponential growth into exponential decline. And if any of you are not sure what that means in real terms, look at the economy pre-2008. So pre-2008, if you'd mapped the economy, you would have seen a system that had exponential growth. It was a system out of control. It took one tiny action, one little change, to bring the world economy to its knees. And that decline was so rapid, it was almost overnight. What we really want in a system is this nice oscillating pattern, this. We have our desired states, and normally we're looking for dynamic equilibrium. So we're looking for our top and our bottom desire, and then we want to put controls in that keeps the system running in between the two. Yeah? So negative good, positive bad. So, two types of models, qualitative and quantitative. We look at the qualitative first so we can really understand the causal relationships. And once we understand the causal relationships, we can then put them together in a quantitative model and we can simulate so we can actually predict what's going to happen in the future. All right, we normally would definitely create our causal loop or our influence diagram first, so our qualitative model should always come first. Okay, influence diagrams, and the reason, why is she telling me how to model influence diagrams? Well, guess what, you're going to be doing this stuff. So influence diagrams are modelled using factors. Influences, they're the arrows that go from one factor to the other. They indicate the direction of the relationship. Um, they usually say whether it's a physical relationship or an um, information relationship, but you don't have to worry about that right now. Delays, we can put on there, and we can look at the identification of feedback. Yeah, because we need to know how the system is behaving. There are many advantages to system dynamics and this particular view. One of them is that instead of modelling small, tiny segments, we can actually model everything. We can model the world if we wanted to. It takes a long time. Feedback becomes clear, becomes really clear where the system is out of control, where it's going wrong. We can do experiments. We can do loads of what-if experiments so we can try and predict the future or find our best case scenario. It makes our mental models explicit. In other words, it helps us question our assumptions. And this is why sometimes working together in groups um, to build a model is really good, because you start to understand how each other thinks, and that's really good. And you question your assumptions, but you get an opportunity to question someone else's. It facilitates communication with a client. I've worked with um, child protection services, I've worked with education, I've worked with the environment agency. And it's very easy to get them to understand um, everything that you've put into a system, everything that you've put into your models, all these streams and millions of pages worth of data. They better understand it when they've got a model in front of them that they can play with and they can actually do their own what-if experiments with. Um, and it helps define a research agenda, because quite often we're looking at the system and we're identifying the information that we need. We identify, okay, we need to know more about this. So therefore we can go out and we say, right, this is what we need to research on. We can be really clear on that. Has its trade-offs. So modelling is only a simplification of reality, it isn't reality. It's a simplification of all modelling is a simplica uh, simplification of um, reality. The faith in the model can sometimes be misplaced. People can actually have such faith in the model that they fail to see what else is going on around them. Validation of the model can sometimes be difficult. 
Okay, so you have some very true, hardcore scientists who say, well, how do you validate that? I always say, is it useful? Has it answered a question? In that case, yes, it's valid. Right? The information and the data gathering can be unbelievably time consuming. Okay? And, and for what you get out of it, sometimes you are looking at huge amounts of data for what seems like a very small model. And of course, there's maths involved. For those of you who do maths, it's not a problem. Um, because you're building your equations, you have to build your equations into, into the model in order to get the simulations to work. So, when we look at system dynamics and we look at system dynamics approach as a data scientist, what we're doing is we're combining predictive, causal and behavioural analytics. Behavioural analytics is a new branch of data analytics that looks specifically at the behaviour of people and the impact of that behaviour on the data that we're collecting or what data we need to collect to better understand the behaviour of people. That's pretty much what it does. This is a qualitative approach. This is mapping causality to understand system behaviour. This is a model with all these reinforcement loops, R, positive reinforcement loops. So these are positive loops, and as you can see, there are 11 positive loops. That is definitely a system out of control. That model doesn't look very big, does it? No, it looks fairly simplified, quite small. You're thinking that must have taken less than two minutes to do. But remember, we have to think about validity. So I have to think about, I have to sell this to somebody that this is a really useful technique. Not just a useful technique, but actually this tells us something. Over a million pages of transcript data went into creating this model over a million pages. It doesn't look like it's a million pages worth of data, does it? Well, this is our job sometimes as a data scientist, is we get all this huge amount of terabytes and terabytes of data, and we turn it into something that is easy and simple to communicate and for you guys to understand. Okay, and then we have, so this is quantitative, a little example of quantitative modeling. And this is a very basic initial population model. I'm going to see if I can get it to work. Nope. I'm going to flick back a second so I can actually press the play button on here and then you get it to work. Is that working? Yeah. Yay. I think I might have accidentally paused it again. Yeah, see, there you are. You can actually see it working. And this is me doing a simulation prediction. See, and as you can see, it's still working. That looks a little bit boring, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and this might be really yeah. useful for some clients. They might look at this and say, yeah, I understand that. I understand the graphs. We can look, see, our population is growing out of control. Um, bit scary because we've got finite resources but there's some really cool software out there at the moment that allows us to do some really cool 3d animated modeling so i'm going to show you a model now of a serial killer because why not so let me get my serial killer model up so we've got a particular dodgy part of town where a serial killer lurks, okay? So this is kind of what's happening. When he gets in the red zone, that's the kill zone, okay? You'll see as they're walking around, there'll be some green elements, okay? That's when he's scoping out his next victim. The killer, if he spots his victim, you'll notice the killer, they're the ones in the black suit, will walk faster, okay? A killer will only kill um, a victim. Victims are the guys in the white shirts. Killer won't kill another killer. And if there's any chance of any witnesses, the killer will give up and walk away. So let's see this going. This is kind of random. So each time we have different, um, there's a different last victim. Um, in the first day, they named the last victim Chris. I think everyone was rooting for him as he was running around the buildings. Sometimes they morph through the buildings. Don't ask me why. Um, and the simulation will keep going until all the victims are dead. 
So let's play. Okay. Too many witnesses for that guy over there. Oh, and the serial killer does like to spend a little time with his victim before moving on. You'll find as there's less victims available, the speed killer will speed up his kills. They, you know, it's very realistic. <laughs> A little bit of green there. Got the kill zone. <laughs> so we'll, while we're watching all these lovely cartoon people lose their lives, I'm going to hand out some paper because we're going to do some, some work. And you guys can start rooting for Chris. Poor Chris. I don't know, he's usually the last person alive. <laughs> I can name them. He's usually over on this side by the time he's finished. Now, we've got some fundamental errors in this model when we think about it. Can we start thinking of some of the fundamental errors? What's that? First of all, yeah, we've got people morphing through buildings. That's really cool. Um, nobody's cleaning up the mess. Yeah, nobody seems to care that we're surrounded by dead bodies. And the, where are the police? Is this such a dodgy part of the town that nobody actually wants to investigate crime in this area? I mean, you could have called it a prison riot. That would have made it a bit more... Yeah. So this is a teaching model. And what we tend to do is we, we take this model and then we give it to students and we say, OK, then, what are all the elements? If you're going to start looking at this quantitative, qualitatively, and we're looking at the number of deaths, we're probably looking at the investigation, the hours of the investigation, and we start to model qualitatively first what it actually takes to investigate a serial killer, which is what you guys are going to do. And then once we've done that, we can add all the animation and the qualitativeness. Sorry. We can, we can add all the quantitative elements and building the equations to this model to actually make it more realistic. So, and this is far better if you work in groups to do it. So I would say, make friends. <laughs> um, and if you've got two or three at a time, and then start to think of modeling the other side of this qualitatively, okay? So how are we going to use the information that we have to identify the information that we need. Now, one of the rules of, of creating qualitative models is that it has to be theoretically quantifiable. Because what we need to do is take that qualitative and turn it into quantitative at some point. All right, so for example, if we want, we might want to look at um, number of kills, that's quite an obvious one. Um, length of time between kills. So instead of just time between kills, we'd want to put length of time between kills. Yeah. Total number of victims. Then we want to look at the resources. So how many police does it take to do an investigation? That would be information needs. So from doing a qualitative model, we can actually see what information we need. Yeah. The relationships between the two. And then we can put it into the system. That would take a long time. This is a teaching exercise that normally takes a couple of weeks. But you guys get, what, 20 minutes to come up with some qualitative modelling? Yeah? And then hopefully, if you let me keep it, I can take it back to my class and say, see, these guys know it. They can do it. Are we trying to like, just like, write down aspects of the modelling or actually like, model it? If you, yeah, actually try and do the modelling. So start with your middle, which is... If I, for me, let's do number of victims as your starting point. Total number of victims as your starting point. And then start to feed in, okay, then what happens when 
Um, so if you've got total number of victims, you've got potential victims. Yeah? Total number of serial killers on the loose. We had three in that one, so that's a scary thought. I didn't see the third one. He was a sneaky one. He was a sneaky one. He was a sneaky one. And then you have to think about, okay, then, is it density of population? Density of population, is it more likelihood that you'd have a serial killer if you've got a very dense population? If you really want to get deep and meaningful, we can actually talk about society and what we do as a society, and do we actually breed serial killers as a society? That means, does the problem actually lie with the serial killer or with us as a society? Should we do something to stop breeding serial killers? This is the bit where I get to chill now and just watch you work. It's still cool. When I said make friends, share your thoughts with each other, okay? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think it is? Computer scientist, that's far enough. Thank you very much. I think we need a name like just my name is, and then we just say. Oh, no, it just goes to it just went to sleep. So. Oh, battery will go for 11 hours. Time. Good one. Uh, I'm going to have a little look and... What, is this what you wanted? Is this the right line? That... Pretend, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Like See, once we've got a few factors, we can start to talk about polarity. Polarity is um, kind of like the direction of the relationship. So when we talk about the arrows, we normally have a plus or a minus sign at the end of an arrow. So if you've got a relationship where they both go in the same direction, so for example, if you've got a savings account and you put money into the bank, then your savings account will go up. So the more money you put in, the higher the amount of savings you've got. That would be indicated with a plus sign because that means both are moving in the same direction. If you've got a savings account and you're like me and you're a sucker for a sale and you're constantly spending money, then your savings account will go down. So the more you spend, the more your savings goes down. That would be indicated with a minus sign because the relationship moves in opposite directions. So when you've got a minus sign, it basically means that relationship is opposite. And when you've got a plus sign, it's the same. So once you've got a few factors, start to think about the relationship. Then. So for example, if you've got more serial killers, you're going to have more victims. Yeah? Or the likelihood of having more victims would definitely rise. So that would be indicated with a plus sign. And you're doing psychology, so you've probably got loads to share. <laughs> <coughs> Share your ideas. Jump up with these guys. Go on, chit chat, make friends. I love this. There's a certain thing about girls when they start to do this kind of thing. They start to list the factors first. They start to think about it in that kind of orderly fashion. Um, we had two girls in the room yesterday and they did exactly the same thing. And I've got to be honest, it's something that I tend to do. Yeah. So, yeah, it's sometimes, okay, what do I need to know? What information do I need? And then I start to look at the relationships and actually mapping it out. Not a bad way to start. This is another reason I love systems modelling, is there is no wrong way, really, of doing it. You've got so many ways of doing it right that it's whatever's easier for you. So... And one of the best things about being a data scientist is that whatever you think you might be into, you can actually get it in, into it because this data is everywhere. So one of my next projects, I'm actually looking at um, viral data and I'm going to be working with biosciences. 
to map all of bioscience data. Such a cool thing to do. The serial killer is still roaming. See, three of them. Can you see the three yeah, now? I see the three now. Yeah. Well, it's still, they're still going, so there's probably, there's still a victim somewhere, so we must be hiding. It's playing dead. Ah, uh, it could be. They're not giving up, are they? <laughs> I love the fact that the traffic doesn't move either. Well. We can add all of those elements in when you do a model. You can add whatever you need to do. You can end up creating huge models that do actually model the world, which is so cool. <coughs> so have we thought about the, fin the uh, resources of the police? Yeah. Have we gone a little delved a little bit deeper? Do we actually have enough money to pay police to actually you know, investigate a crime of this magnitude. Don't get me started on current economic climates and cuts to public services and all that kind of stuff. But all of that would have a massive impact, wouldn't it? You know, and if we have to divert funds from normal everyday police work to work on a particularly harrowing investigation and a very big investigation, what does that do for everyday normal policing? <clears throat> and if you're married to a policeman who happens to be working 40 hour shifts and he's never home, what does that do to society? See, you can start modeling the world here. One little serial killer, well, one big serial killer, can have a massive impact. And then we think of the victims, and what does that do for the victims' families? And what impact does that have on our resources? Yeah? Because don't forget, when you talk about police resources, and not just the investigation of the crime, it's also about victim support, family liaison. Huge amounts of resources we're using. I'm going to have a look on this side. Let me see what you guys are up to. You are by far the quietest group this week, I have to say. So what do you mean about the feedback, the, the loops? What, what they as you start building um, your model, you'll start to identify where there are loops. And when there's loops, you can see whether something is out of control or not. So positive feedback loop, it would be a system out of control. Mm -hmm. That's normally indicated by counting to be honest in the loop count the number of minus signs if there is even minus minus signs it'll be a, a reinforcement loop a positive feedback loop zero counts as an even number for the purposes of modeling okay. yeah and if you've got a plus sign um if you've got sorry if you've got odd amount of um minus signs mm. and you've got a negative feedback loop then mm. and that would be a system imbalance so it kind of balance itself out Okay, so yeah. you need a, well, you should have an odd, odd number. Yeah, okay. what we should have is building a system with lots of odd. I'm finding, I think we end up with things, like, things could go one or two ways, like, if, if that happens, then things go that way. But things could go that way. So, which one of you? Well, like, for this one, I put, like, in, like, they need more investment in the police, and obviously if they get it, then they'll be... So you've ended like up that. with a nice big loop. Well, yeah. Yeah. Still. But is that, is that how it... Yeah, that's what happens. We end up with a nice big loop. And then once we get our loop, we can start to add the, um, the minus signs. And if it's an even number of minus signs, you've Did got you a reinforcement loop. The whole thing? Yeah, the li lots and lots of different loops. If I bring up, the, um, I'll bring up the model again with all the loops in it, and you can see all the different loops and the structure. So that's a plus. So that's a balancing loop you've got there. So, see, so you can see all of these are loops. So when you look at that, you've got staff morale going to the level of acceptance of poor behaviours, yeah, and then your level of denial, level of disengagement. Um, and then that goes back to staff morale. So when you've got a disengagement from uh, staff, then you've got low staff morale. 
Yep. And that's just one example of one of the loops. And then you can have loops inside loops. It starts to get very confusing. But if you've got loops inside loops and then negative loops inside negative loops, then you've just got this continual reinforcement of, of poor behaviours, a system that's out of control. You might have a negative loop inside a positive loop, and sometimes you can say, well, actually, that's OK, because the bigger loop is positive. So even though it feels like the system might be going out of control in one part, as an overall thing, it might actually balance out. So then it's not too bad. So come to Cardiff University and model serial killers. Yay! <laughs> So we actually started to look at some of the relationships now. Yeah, so the amount of police would affect how many murders. Yes. Yeah. So do we need Bobby's back on the beat? Yeah. Yeah. And when we talk about highly populated areas, so if we live in a really highly populated yeah. area, we could say, does it actually increase the potential victims? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, does it make it really difficult for the serial killer to actually find victims because there are so many people around? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the reason a serial killer becomes a b serial killer is because they go undetected. Yeah. yeah. So if you think about what constitutes the serial killing, I think it used to be five victims. It might be lower than that now. Um, but in order to get to three, four, five victims, yeah. you need to go undetected, yeah. don't you? Yeah. And then you think of, um, if you think of the mindset, and that guy there is doing psychology, so he probably knows a bit more than we do. But if you think of the mindset of a serial killer, and then you start to think, when they go undetected for too long, they start to bait the police. And how many times have you heard that? They want, and they say it's like they want to be caught. No, they're playing the cat and mouse kind of game. Mm -hmm. They're so into the game of it then, that they want to, they want to leave clues. They want to, I'm cleverer than you kind of thing. Like yeah. So even if you think right back to the most famous serial killer in the UK, which was Jack the Ripper, he was writing to the police, wasn't he? It was almost like, look at me, look how clever I am. You know? Yeah. And that's ca and when you understand that kind of mindset, and that's what criminologists, um, criminologists do, obviously, they try to understand the mindset of the people who commit these crimes, so they can find ways of um, of stopping them. So. We've got the Crime Institute of Cardiff and we're actually looking at some of this and modelling some of this, working with psychologists and criminologists and um, computer scientists and data scientists to find a way of how can we reduce the likelihood of um, these kind of crimes. So there are some very... Computer science is at the core of pretty much everything and when you think of data science particularly, it's a very exciting world to be living in right now. I don't mean because there's lots of serial killers, I mean because the opportunities that you have to be involved in research that is so diverse. Mm -hmm. And when you go into computer science, don't think I'm going to be a coder, yeah. because it is such a diverse range of things that you can actually do with computer science. So by the time you guys graduate from there, we'll have moved on even more, you know? There'll be much more greater advances in AI and data science and artificial, well, artificial intelligence, machine learning, internet of things, smart cities. I mean, you look, 10 years ago, there was no iPads. How crazy is that? You know? You look at a smartphone today. I look, I, my first mobile phone was bigger than my house phone. The very first time I used a mobile phone, I had to carry a battery pack around with me. A, li literally a strap around the office. And as you're talking into the mobile phone, you're shouting, and you're like, I may as well just, just open the window and I'll shout to you. It's fine. It's fine. You know, because if the signals were popping in and out all the time. You had this great big aerial you had to pull up. Watch some films from the early 80s, okay? <laughs> that was my life. Watch them. 